October 3rd. I wish it was October Friday. Th no. October 6th. <laughs> October 6th. It's printed November, wrong. November. 6th. November. <laughs> Do I have the right agenda? <laughs> I guess I got to look this over before I just read it off. <laughs> it does say October 3rd, correct? Okay. Okay. <laughs> Woo. All right. Okay. So, so I'm back into the right time warp here. Um, I'd like to call the meeting to order. And if we could call the roll, please, Ms. Farron. Anderson. Here. Appenfelt. Here. Bonnet. Here. Burnett. Here. Marie. Fisher. Here. Hansen. Keel. Here. Mark. Here. Olson. Present. Perkins. Here. Wissell. Here. Yads. Here. Zap. Here. Please let the record show that Alderperson Hansen and Faree are absent and excused. Uh, we will move on to the Pledge of Allegiance, and during our silent deliberation, I'd like you to remember our veterans as we celebrate Veterans Day this weekend, and also to all of the areas of uh, around the world that are um, experiencing war and just the and and thinking about peace at this time, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands. All right, we will move on to agenda item number three, time for informal public hearing. Is there anyone joining us this evening in our audience here in person or online that would like to speak to council this evening? I'll invite you forward if you want to come right up to the podium right here, sir. Thank you. And if you could take the microphone and we'd like for if you wouldn't mind just speaking directly into the microphone, you got to kind of hold it close in order for it to pick up. And then please state your name and your address. And then you My have name is three Randy minutes. Dykstra. I live in Waupon, 827 Sunset Avenue. Uh, the reason I'm here tonight is in regards to a property that I own in Beaverdam at uh, 402 Mary Street, uh, corner of Mary and uh, I think it's 4th Street. Um, I received a bill in regards to a violation of uh, something that was left out for bulk pickup uh, that violated the rules. Uh, the bills for 150 bucks. Um, it's not the first time at that property that I got this. Uh, I've gone to the Department of Public Works um, with my objection to it. That's our policy. The problem I have with the policy is that they either tag the item or they tag the door at the apartment. I don't get notified. So I want a policy change in regards to how they handle that procedure so that I'm notified at the billing address that the bill came to uh, so that I have an opportunity to rectify it. Uh, I have no opportunity to rectify it. When I get a $150 bill in the mail for an exercise bike in the easement, I get angry. <laughs> it's irritating. Of course, the tenants claim that this did not come from them. First time around, I kind of believed it. Second time around, I don't know. But I need to be notified on these things. I have one that's gone to my tax bill, and I have one that's current. I would like to have them rescinded. Uh, 402 Mary Street. I don't know who my older person is. No? Yeah, we, we can't address you right now. If this is just time for you to oh. share. But we can, we'll take it and look it up and find out who your older person is. And if you, um, could you state your name one more time? Randy Dykstra. Randy Dykstra. Okay. And uh, we can, we can certainly follow up internal and, and, uh, and with, and council will get a report on that again. Did you have anything else you wanted to share? Uh, time is of the essence. When could I expect an answer? Oh, it'll be discussed within the next couple weeks here and working through that and the process. And Will I be contacted? Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for coming tonight. Appreciate it.
there anyone else uh, that would like to talk with council this evening, either in uh, in person here in the audience or online? Again, if you'd like to speak with council this evening, please do so now. All right, very good. Uh, hearing no other comments, we're going to move on then to agenda item number four, announcements. Uh, as I stated, this Saturday, November 11th, is, of course, Veterans Day. As a reminder, on Sunday, the 12th, is a Veterans Day dinner that will be held at the American Legion at 5 p.m. in case anyone is interested in attending. Um, there is the economic update luncheon that will be held next week, Thursday, November 16th. This is put on by the chamber and will be held at Springbrook this year. A number of individuals will be speaking, representing city, county, uh, state, as well as the school district. Uh, next week, Thursday, November 16th, you, council members are invited. You should have received an invitation to the Generac groundbreaking at 1.30 p.m. And if you'd like to attend that, we'd love to see you there. Sunday, November 19th is the Paddle City Jazz Band at 2 p.m. It's a wonderful way to support the arts in our community from really talented musicians if you uh, want to check that out are there other comments uh, anybody need any have anything else that they'd like to share this evening okay very good we will move on then to agenda item number five our disposition of minutes of the common council meeting of october 16th 2023 i think that one is the right date <laughs> Um, I'd entertain a motion to approve. Yes. Move to approve the minutes as written. Thank you. Alderperson Wassell, is there a second? I'll Alder, second. Alderperson Zapp, thank you. Um, any comments or questions regarding the minutes? All those in favor of approving the minutes, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, nay? Any abstentions? Thank you. Moving on to agenda item number six, the city administrator's report. Just a couple of things to pass on to the council. Uh, first, uh, we completed interviews for the deputy clerk uh, and we are going to be extending, uh, or we have already extended an offer to uh, Vicki um, uh, Orm, who's our currently serving in our finance department, um, but she rose to the top. So we're excited to have her uh, take on that, that uh, position. Um, also, DRC met last week uh, and reviewed the resolution for uh, the ARPA dollars that we set aside for housing redevelopment or housing rehab um, and had a very uh, good conversation. And so they'll be reviewing that and um, uh, reviewing a policy and uh, hope to bring more information uh, forward to the council. I also want to report that Public Works uh, and uh, uh, our Director of Engineering met with uh, Mr. Lehner uh, with regard to uh, LEAF um, collection this year, uh, just to coordinate. Um, we are changing the process somewhat in that we're going to be um, filtering the leaves and grinding them. Um, so uh, there should be no claim whatsoever uh, that uh, there are any inorganics that were caused by by us. Um, so that should um, put that concern to rest. Um, and then uh, finally, just a comment on, uh, thank you, Mayor, for mentioning the, the GENERAC uh, uh, groundbreaking. If there are members who are interested in attending, please just let me know. Uh, GENERAC's asked for us to RSVP. Um, if you're not planning, you don't have to let me know. But if you are, um, I, I just appreciate the advance, the advance notice. That's all I got. Thank you. Good stuff. All right, moving on to agenda items number seven, communications. Do we have any communications? There are no communications this evening. Thank you, Ms. Farron. Moving on to the bills, I'd entertain a motion to approve the bills. Alder Person Martin. Um, I'll make a motion to uh, pass the paying of the bills as it was approved by the administrative committee. Thank you, Alder Person Mark. Is there a second? Alder Person with Cell. I'll second that. Thank you, Alder Person with Cell. Comments or questions regarding the bills? All those in favor of approving the bills, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, nay? Any abstentions? 
Thank you. Uh, moving on to agenda item number nine, presentation by City Administrator Nathan Teal and Finance Director Kayla Larson regarding draft 2024 budget and action on new 2024 requests. Wonderful. I actually uh, gave Kayla the opportunity to, to sit and rest. She's going to come up to fill in any blanks that I might miss, um, but we'll see her uh, at the actual public hearing and she'll be presenting at the public hearing. Um, just uh, real quick tonight, we're going to do uh, just go through an out, outline. Uh, the general fund uh, budget, we're going to go over the background um, and especially the what we discussed at the workshop. We'll review the general fund budget, particularly the impact um, to the taxpayer. Uh, then we'll review the new requests. Uh, afterwards, we'll then talk about the CIP budget background. Uh, and review the capital improvement program budget. Um, and it's not on here, but we'll also uh, touch base on the utilities, which will um, feed into Ellers. They're, they're here to also present this evening on the, on the water um, fund. So with that, based on the feedback we received uh, from the budget workshop, Kayla and I reviewed and refined revenues and expenses one more time. Uh, Todd also reviewed the capital improvement plan and we made modest adjustments and ultimately uh, we were able to uh, balance the budget, uh, lower the mill rate and keep the actual tax uh, impact flat compared to last year, uh, maintain the level of new debt issuance to 4 million. We also were able to apply 150,000 of the state transportation aids towards street maintenance uh, projects and maintain 1 million in street rehab. And then the 2024 capital improvement program also includes the library roof and the rotary park uh, wall rebuild. Uh, we also arranged future projects uh, over the next five years to maintain the 4 million limit on new debt. Um, Todd, if you'll go to the next slide. Uh, going through the background uh, information, uh, this draft budget is based off of the workshop feedback. Um, we published it November 4th uh, in order to give us sufficient time to have it uh, in the newspaper for a public hearing on November 20th. Um, so tonight, uh, uh, unlike the workshop where we focused on the CIP and introduced the new budget process, which was basically the base budget plus uh, new requests, uh, tonight we want to kind of solidify um, kind of some of the open questions, right? Um, specifically, the new requests, we want to make sure that everybody's uh, aware and that there's some action on, on moving forward or amending whatever is the pleasure of the council. We also wanted to make sure that our revenue, our fee schedule uh, is, is appropriate. Uh, that was reviewed by our admin committee. And then um, finally, the adjustments that we made to the CIP. So that's what we're going to be reviewing this evening. Um, the workshop direction for the general fund, the biggest concern was property tax uh, impact. Uh, they also, there was a desire to evaluate comparable municipalities. Uh, so we'll provide that tonight. And then also there were minimal questions or concerns uh, with the recommended new requests. And so we made some modest adjustments, um, but uh, in general, we kept much of it the same. So if you go to the next slide, Todd, I know there's a lot of information here. I'm going to speak very simply. We're going to try to keep this very brief, but I, I want to point out a couple of things on the slide. First off, uh, the allowable levy, the, the basic changes that occurred because the allowable levy was the 319 that we talked about at the workshop, as well as the 434,000 of the state trust fund. Those are the main adjustments to the allowable levy. That 434,000 basically represents the library right? The library roof. The next um, uh, column over, the remaining levy, we're just trying to demonstrate that we were able to balance things out, okay? And I'm going to spend the majority of time on what the proposed budget and the adjustments that we made. So the proposed budget included the 319 of allowable levy. We were, Kayla and I went through the revenues uh, one more time, uh, Kayla, when we presented before, we told you that we were making them very conservative. We went through and made some modest adjustments that we felt were were relevant and applicable. Uh, and so that adjusted 139,000 in the favor. 
uh, expenses, there was, we reviewed salaries and wages. There were a few um, retirements that are coming up and their replacements will be at a lower wage. Um, and so with those lower wage replacements, we, we made those modest adjustments uh, with attrition. Um, the insurance negotiated rate, we're going to be talking about that later tonight, but basically we applied the one, uh, well, I should clarify, what we had originally brought to you was a 6.8% uh, negotiated rate, which was the 75,000 approximately. Um, we got that to, uh, in our discussions, 4.8. And so it's now $107,000. With that, um, the other, the change in provider, that one got scratched, right? Because you can only do one or the other. The recreational rental fees uh, increases, we, we included that. And then the new requests, uh, as we went through, um, the, the changes here are, are fairly simple. Um, we changed the new request, the operations included an additional 44,000 um, uh, revenue for um, basically EMS fees. And we applied that as, uh, and, and fire fees and inspection fees. And we applied that as an offset to the fire inspector. So it reduced the 163. And then we also eliminated the, the uh, chemical munitions. The new equipment requests, um, previously we hadn't included the capital, the, the CIP, uh, the police boiler. This includes 70,000 of the police boiler uh, in, this, in this line item. And the remainder will be paid using the state trust fund, okay? And then finally, we added 150,000, which is basic, we didn't add, but we took 150,000 um, for street maintenance. So basically, instead of us using debt service uh, as our only um, source of revenue for street maintenance and, and street improvement, we're now applying uh, a portion of our general revenue to, um, to reduce our need or our, our reliance on debt service um, in the future. Any questions on this slide? Okay. So the next slide is going to basically go over the impact to the taxpayer. So median house values in 2022 was 166,000. Uh, this year, that median house value sh shifted 6.92% 6 to $177,800 for the median home. Uh, the EV mill rate, um, was 890 last year. So the equalized value mill rate was 890 last year. At the budget workshop, we did need to clarify, we had put the 944, that was uh, our bad, um, but it was 890 uh, with a reduction then um, according to what we're presenting would be 850. Um, but generally speaking, we already know what our mill rate's going to be. So we just, we, we're skipping that. <laughs> you don't even need to look at that. The, the true mill rate is going to be the difference between 944 is now being reduced to 885. Um, so it's a 59 cents reduction. Um, and then as far as the actual impact to the median homeowner, it equates to $3 and 66 cents. Um, so basically a, a flat, um, flat increase. Um, if we go to the next slide, um, for the purposes of just kind of demonstrating where we're at, um, this gives us a little bit of history and helps us see the city mill rate over time. Um, if you look at the green line, the green line is Beaver Dam. So we are, were higher in the, in the pack um, compared to the comparables. But I'd remind you of two things. One, policy-wise, Beaver Dam had already always taken an approach of not ch having charges for services, right? So all things aren't equal when we look at mill rates. It's it's nice to look at, but it may not be apples to apples because we said the Beaver Dam policy wise wanted to basically uh, take care of their their expenses within um, uh, within the the tax levy itself, right? Um, so there's a couple of things that I would highlight here. The jump that you see in 2014 and 2015,
basically that's reflective of the debt service increase that you guys had particular because of i believe the police station that 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 lag there's a little bit of lag in time but that was that jump comparable jump in debt service was with the public works building right instead of us going up and jumping we're actually going down that's that's something to be commended you guys are making good decisions and we're we're moving in the right direction if you will part of that decrease down is because we shifted to a charge for service last year right with solid waste so i just want to note that when you look at there's more to this story than sometimes meets the eye if that makes sense um but that 885 is basically reflective of where we're going to be in 2023 I didn't care. We don't have all the numbers of the other municipalities, so I didn't carry it forward uh, clearly. Um, but that that gives you kind of a history of where we're at um, from as a community. And I think, again, you should be commended and remind you that three dollars of that of your mill rate of that eight dollars is debt service. Right. So as as you guys continue to look forward and trying to reduce your reliance on debt service, that will shrink, right? Go to the next slide. We'll go through the new requests. So here is just a total uh, of the, just a reminder of all the requests that we had um, that staff brought forward this year. So if you'll recall, the base budget was basically um, uh, inflationary costs, right? And costs that we expected due to contractual increases for salaries and, and wages and also benefits, right? Um, the new requests, I basically asked department heads if there's any new program or if there is a capital outlay uh, that you typically would have would have um, uh, petitioned for, that's what this new request list is. Um, from that, I whittled it down. Um, and so we're going to review the operational new requests and the equipment requests next. So Todd, if you'll go to the next slide. So the operational requests, um, uh, I think you've all seen them. You had it in your packet, the ones that I'm, I'm recommending moving forward. I would remind you that with these personnel, we really did strive to offset those costs. Um, for instance, with public works, that's offsetting overtime, it's offsetting um, a part-time, and it's also uh, reallocating uh, wages of an elect what was an electrician position. Um, the If we were to eliminate that position, I would just caution that that's not going to necessarily mean that your budget, you're going to have more money freed up because we're still going to need to utilize those offsets for doing the overtime for doing the 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 part-time work and so forth uh and ex so anyways the civil engineering i think you understand where that revenue is coming from we talked about that last year this year we're actually going to uh, implement it the fire inspection we included um the new revenues that the fire department that was a comment that was made during the workshop is that if we had more revenues to offset that that uh this would be um a bit, it would be more swallowable. swallowable. Um, so these are the new operation costs that, that um, I'm recommending uh, move forward. The next uh, is the equipment uh, new requests. Um, basically uh, the first three are, are items we typically would have done, but would have been capital outlay and we would have issued debt service for. <laughs> So we're now absorbing this using revenue. We're using our general fund to absorb this. Um, the cardiac monitor replacement that we've gotten a, a grant for 50,000, we're to cover the remaining 100,000 balance. Uh, the brush chipper, instead of us issuing debt, we're recommending using general fund. And then the police boiler, like I said, um, we were able to absorb uh, with general revenue uh, with exception of 25,000, which we're going to use the state trust funders. That's what I'm proposing. So with that, the next slide, we'll kind of take a break. Um, but I'm basically asking to entertain a motion uh, to approve these recommended new requests. 
Um, if there are any questions or comments, we can um, uh, take them at that time. And then I'd like to um, uh, go back or review the uh, CIP um, rest of the presentation. Alder Person with so. Just clarification, um, a motion we make now, we'll just approve these to go to the public hearing. And after the public hearing, we would vote on those being implemented. Yeah, so the the hope is is that if you're going to ask me to amend, I would like to be able to come to the public hearing prepared with a, a budget that everybody is satisfied with. So the open items that, again, like I commented on, the insurance was an open-ended item, the fee schedules is an open-ended item, the, these requests are an open-ended. So I'm asking basically for uh, your blessing <laughs> on these and these would these have been included in the proposed budget that was published but if you were to tell me otherwise we would we would need to make the i would want to make those modifications so that we can have a refined budget at the public hearing does that make sense all the person present how can we support this if we haven't heard from the public, I mean, it, that may change some things. I don't disagree. You can, you can, if the public were to come in and say they wanted to change X, Y, and Z, you're still going to be able to do that at the public hearing. But as staff, I don't want to bring, I, <laughs> I'm hoping to bring a complete product to the, to the public hearing. Alder person Anderson. I guess I'm just very confused also. Um, I thought the budget was proposed to us, then we went through it, and then once we voted on it, then it got published, or in between somehow. I guess we've always just published a draft without any input from the council. Yeah. Um, no, normally, at least that's the process that I've seen in the past, yeah. is... is the the public hearing is the time when you usually you'll work through the budget process you'll refine some things at the workshop um uh but then you you I'm bring not it talking about what we did this year i'm talking about what we've done in the past we've never had a workshop well okay last year we had yeah. the workshop but i could have swore so this got published i had no idea that this draft got published to the public so if it got published to the public, where did that get published? And yeah, I haven't heard any feedback. So before you host a public hearing, you the the draft, the proposed budget was in the packet. Um, you publish it and then you have to publish it so many weeks in advance of the public hearing. Um, okay. And so I will wait till after the public hearing to make any changes. Thank you. Other person with cell. I do have a couple of questions uh, concerning the new employees. Um, the offsets that you've shown are very good. Um, a little bit concerned about the future, 2025 and on. Um, will some of those same offsets still be in place for like the fire inspector and the PW employee? The offsets will still be in place. Um, with the fire inspector, this is a half year. So in 2025, uh, it should be noted that um, the full the full wage will, will take place, right? Um, so there will be a, uh, an additional cost. Um, but what I would say in, 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 uh, to the fire, uh, for, on behalf of the fire is that they've seen some pretty significant revenue increases over the past couple of years. Um, in particular, um, with, uh, uh, both, the uh, uh, contributions from the townships as well as EMS, uh, as well as, um, the, the fees, uh, that we've, we've issued. Uh, and so because of that, um, if you were to look at that alone, they've more than covered uh, this position and they've more than covered the even I think the positions that uh, the referendum 
um, put forward. I, I forget when you guys did the referendum. It was four years ago, um, two years ago, 2021 then. So uh, covering six personnel. A good portion of it. New, um, new income. Yes, correct. With fire, with the fire, we've probably seen close to about, Kayla, you can correct me. I know we had 150 this year of new income uh, with the 2%, the 2%, that's 95,000, which the 2% is really supposed to be covering uh, inspections as well. So it's not like we, there's justification for uh, within the revenues that we've received for this position. Typically, though, we've said we're going to absorb those and and reduce the bottom line of the general uh, cost of, of fire. But even when you look, um, we, we've seen some pretty significant gains in revenues for fire and EMS. So just to clarify, though, you said 150000 Just this year. But then but that doesn't cover six personnel. No, uh, Chief, I know you're here. The how much did we see in township revenue? Um, the, the other number you're referring to, so from I have that open, so if you don't mind, I'll, I'll go to that one first. But the EMS revenue from 2021, uh, we brought in $666,647. Um, and this year we're on pace for $926,555. Um, so in the past two years, that's been an increase of roughly $259,000 dollars just on the EMS revenue alone. <laughs> we got all sorts of paperwork here. I apologize. Give me a second. I'm not seeing the paper here. If you give me a second, I can pull it up on my iPad. Yeah, for this current year. No, I don't have. So I have 2023, I believe. I said, didn't see it. Yeah. The, the public works full time staff will never reach what the electrician was making hourly, and the seasonal employee that would not go ahead unless we came back to the full council. For approval so that will not change in the future so so just to clarify dan great. so you you got rid of the electric electrician position is that what you're saying no the electrician position was filled but we don't have a master electrician so we're not paying that oh higher at the higher dollar. level correct in order to get a licensed electrician we had to pay a higher dollar amount we weren't able to fill that with that we have somebody in-house that's able to do the work very mm -hmm. well for the city okay Oh, okay, I apologize. All right. I was looking at the wrong wrong paperwork here. So um, next year we are budgeting five hundred seventy nine thousand uh, five hundred uh, five seventy nine five hundred seventy four um, e for fire and EMS revenue from the townships. Um, when, we, when you compare that to two thousand twenty one before the increase, we're at three hundred sixty two thousand eight hundred seventy two. So you're roughly two hundred and what do we have there about two hundred and seventeen thousand plus the nearly. 300,000 um, in EMS revenue since 2021. And so I know when Nathan and I talked, I, I believe my comment was the new revenue since the renegotiation of the contract and the new EMS revenue was equivalent to what the um, to what the referendum actually was. Um, I don't think that if you actually look at it in, in today's numbers, um, that probably doesn't cover six people, but it covered the cost of the referendum at the time. And I believe that was our conversation. Right. It's better and different. It's still a significant amount of of revenue in comparison, um, and so the I th and chief, you can speak to this as far as what why the need for inspections 
Um, but currently right now with the guys that we have in place um, being called out and so forth, we're, we're not fulfilling um, the, the full level of service that, that um, we should be fulfilling. Um, and so uh, again, I would comment that we've made, um, we've reduced the amount of debt service. <laughs> we've, we've made it work within the, the budget. We balanced, balanced things. Uh, even if you were to do reductions from what I proposed, even if you were to do reductions from what I proposed, my recommendation would still be to basically we'd be subsidizing more of the state trust fund on the library roof. And we'd be sending more general fund dollars to the CIP. That's that's basically what would what would take what I would be recommending us move forward um, doing. I think that the requests that we're asking are are appropriate. I understand that you know in 2025 we may need to absorb another half half position, but think about it in the in the future. It, if we came to you in in 2025 and we asked for a full position. Would it be any easier then, right? With a public works position, when was the last time we added a public works position? And how many roads have we added in the last <laughs> even five years, right? Uh, we're going to be adding Kellum Road, right, to the to the infrastructure this coming year. Something's got to give. Um, and so I don't think that what's being proposed is is out of line or inappropriate and we've done it and it's three dollars like that's i think that's pretty good i would i would i would call victory <laughs> but but that's me can you explain the three dollars i guess what is the actual number of increase in our budget that because i'm looking at a different at a number that looks like like what's the actual increase rather than talking about levy and such Here's where we were last year. This is where we're at this year. What's the actual amount that we're increasing? I think the thing that's difficult to compare that is because of adding in additional uh, revenue and expenses to the ERP. So if you're looking at an expense from year to year, you're going to look like your expenses jumped. Um, but we also had the revenues that jumped along with it. Yeah, so what, what Kayla's saying is, is with... Well, we talked about it in budget, and I didn't include this a part of the draft because I thought that was pretty much uh, everybody was in in consensus or had consensus on that. Um, and I didn't want to necessarily go into go into those details. I figured we would address those during the actual public hearing. I've been told to keep things simpler, <laughs> so I tried to keep it uh, fairly easy and digestible tonight. Um, but the point that Kayla's making is we've probably increased about one point, I think it was 1.5, um, just with ERP alone. Um, uh, the idea of, of, uh, including a portion of, let's say, uh, our, our capital improvement, the, the street maintenance, right. Uh, and doing a transfer, uh, uh having a portion of, uh, our building ins or having our building inspections actually reflected both revenue and expenses. Having a room tax reflected both revenues and expenses. There were there were tricks of the trade from an accounting practice that helped us meet expenditure restraint, the expenditure restraint program in the past. And now we're basically trying to build in that buffer again because we've got a year to relax it. So I agree with Kayla. It's it's not going to be apples to apples. It's going to appear like our budget uh, grew substantially, but really a good portion that's just us recognizing the actual revenues and actual expenses that we had rather than only recognizing the net. I do think one thing that is noteworthy too is, um, I mean, really the new equipment requests that 459,000, I mean, that's a this year cost that's in the general fund. Um, now, we want to start recognizing kind of what that cost is on an annual basis to prepare for what that replacement's going to be in 10 years, 15 years, 20 years. However, that 459 is, is technically available for next year for use in other areas of the budget as well. Or um, I just want that to be, to be known that that is in the 
general fund expenses, that's not necessarily a reoccurring cost at four hundred and fifty nine thousand dollars. <laughs> So I guess I, back to my question, I don't know that that was really, I don't know what. So if I take, we've got about 17,000 people here. You're saying it costs every taxpayer $3. $51,000 is what we're increasing or that we need to get extra money in from the city. Is that correct? No, the, the $3 is on the median home value, right? So let's say your home value, whether... If your home value is, is, let's say, twice the median, then you'd be paying six bucks more, right? Um, but it's going to be fairly flat uh, from the city city standpoint as it was last year. It's not going to be significant. It's If you look at it at the percentage basis, it's less than a quarter of a percent increase. Which equals how much in money that we're asking 17,000 people to, I mean, it's going to vary among the the homeowners. I'm just asking, what's the. Oh, what's the total amount from a, a total levy? Correct. Um, well, so the point, yeah. So the 0.6% was like 90,000. So let's just back back into it. Uh, it would be, it'd be less than 30,000. It'd be $30,000. an additional $30,000 in property tax total net. And if it's not the will of the pleasure of the, the council to, if they'd like to wait till the public hearing, that's fine too. We can, we can vote on the, vote on these, but I guess I was hoping to know what, if anything, you want me to change uh, in those recommended uh, uh, recommended requests. Whether council decides to change that or not, I just want to just bring a few things forward for consideration, I guess, but go ahead first, Jack. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. <clears throat> If I understand it right now, we have one full time fire inspector, right? No, we we, we, have, we have we have our EMTs, our our currently paid fire firefighters, who are trained to be uh, inspectors, and when they have um, available time, they will do inspections. Right now, our inspection, I think, we're probably forget what the percentage was of how many we need to do versus uh, the demand. Yeah, over the last several years, um, outside of COVID, because COVID screwed everything up and uh, inspections were suspended. But we're hovering anywhere from 48% to probably 53% of the inspections that we're supposed to be getting done have been getting done. Um, and Nathan did a pretty good job of explaining that. Um, the issue is that our inspectors are also um, staffing the ambulance and they're staffing the trucks. Uh, so today was a good example. Um, before lunchtime today, I think there were nine or 10 ambulance calls. Uh, that's time that our inspectors would hopefully be out inspecting. Um, they can't go inspecting when when they're fielding 911 calls. So that's the problem we're running into. Um, we have the inspections to do. Um, and uh, it seems like every year uh, the call volume is going up. Uh, and um, I know that there were positions added previously. Um, the idea... Again, I wasn't here for that, but the idea was that those positions were here so we could staff three ambulances daily. Um, so if I have somebody on vacation or somebody's out sick or somebody's at training, um, my inspectors don't go out. There's just not that opportunity. Okay, the question I have is, do we need another full-time inspector? Can we make it down to a half time and share it with another municipality or something. All their job is to do is just do inspections all day long. Is that possible? And so is it possible to share one? Um, theoretically, I would say yes, with the number of inspections we have. Um, we did do an ordinance change uh, previously. As of the beginning of the year, we had to do a minimum of, we'll say 22 to 2300 fire inspections. Um, you guys did make an ordinance change with the new fire prevention code that um, allows us to do some inspections just annually instead of twice a year. 
Um, I'm estimating that we're going to hopefully cut four to 500 inspections off that. So we'll probably be 17 to 1800 inspections per year. Um, but every single violation that my inspector writes, they have to go back and they have to reinspect. Uh, so if we have 1700 inspections to do and we write 300 violations, we're right back to the 2000 inspections. Um, and simply doing the inspections too and gaining compliance, it's kind of two different stories. Um, you can spend a lot of time. Um, it's very easy to spend an entire day on one inspection, uh, not actually conducting the inspection, but um, you do have to do background work. You do have to be able to look up the code. You have to document it correctly, and then you have to do a lot of education with um, with building owners and with uh, business owners. And so, would I say that half time would be enough? I, I don't see that happening. Or even with, right now, we have an inspector for you know for new property and whatever. He's kind of like half time with other cities. I mean, there's got to be a way we can figure this out. We're paying for a full time employee to inspect them. You know, I mean, do we need another full time? Do we make it? Do we make it a full time inspector, and that's all they do? So I can tell instead you of pulling people off all the time, because otherwise it's a mismatch. Yeah, and that's. I mean, that's part of the problem. Even. <clears throat> I suspect even with a full-time inspector, I'm still going to have to have um, some of my uh, my shifts go out and do additional inspections to make sure that we actually get everything done. I mean, we're, we're going from, you know, my goal would be 100% compliance, and we're going from roughly 50%, um, hopefully getting up to that 100%, but um, it's going to be a challenge either way. Just out of curiosity, what would a, a, a peer in fire inspector run for salary wise no emt no fire you know going out on fires just a pure fire inspector so what i what i am asking for is a fire inspector that has um that can be a firefighter and can be an emt um and so you're going to probably pay a little more for that um but i'll also have that person in case of an emergency they can't respond if need be so if there's a significant event um or if for today as an example, if we have three ambulances out and I have to call people back in to take the fourth call, uh, that person can fill that role. Um, they're going to cost a little bit more. I would suspect that we could probably, um, we may be able to get one cheaper without uh, without being a firefighter or EMT, but um, that's not anything I have numbers on here today. Chief, my understanding was the difficulty with uh, going out and getting uh, an individual that was just a fire inspector, not um, uh, didn't have the credentials of firefighter EMT. Uh, the issue that you run into is, is the pool, the candidate pool becomes very, very thin. Uh, and the ability to um, actually find somebody uh, is, is going to be um, difficult. Yeah, a big thing with that, uh, police and fire are under the protective service retirement. Um, system for the state of Wisconsin. And so to pull somebody from a sworn position where you're protective service and you can retire at 53, you get full benefits to um, having to work until you're 65. Um, there's not many firefighters or people with that experience out there that are going to be interested in doing that. Um, I, I know that um, some places, um, I believe Madison has what you call civilian inspectors. Um, some places do it. Um, but they also have a lot more resources and they have a lot more opportunity to say hire somebody and actually do all the training and send them through that. So I guess I, I, I just bring forward uh, some thoughts and maybe chief, you want to, uh, we and again, I'm and looking at the cost of a person. I mean, I think you're looking anywhere from eighty to ninety thousand dollars per person. Okay, and so we just hired the six, so that's about anywhere from four hundred some thousand to five hundred some thousand dollars a year on salaries and benefits. Um, if you're talking about, I think there's a little bit, just some things to consider that that worry me, I guess, and, and things to think about. So uh, the city of Watertown just approved, they're working on contracts right now for their police and fire. They agree, they're agreeing to a 10% increase next year for police. 
and a 5% the following year. And the unions are not agreeing to that. So my question is, is we're looking good this year. Um, my worry is, is taking on a union position like this as an even comparison to the other positions, we can't ever get rid of that position. We could get rid of the public works or the engineering if we decided to because budgets were difficult. Um, something to consider there. I think, you know, and looking at, I, I think what really um, I would like to focus on is the innovation fund that's come out of the state of Wisconsin, out of the Republican um, legislature, um, looking at the three-year pilot program that incentivizes local governments to come together and provide services um, that do it efficiently. And one of those things could be there are third-party entities out there that do fire inspections. Um, I, I would like to have seen that we've at least researched that. Um, I think it's, as you noted, I mean, there's huge costs, in, and especially in retirement costs for um, these positions. Um, something to consider. And I, I, guess I, I guess I just wish that there was more research done on if there are other options out there. Um, so just my comment then. Yes. Older person will sell. Kind of a simple question. How do we fund the half person? Is this person starting at halfway through the year? Yeah. So in order to um, actually take the time and, and do it right, um, I wanted to take, take it up until about July to actually get everything in place and get them hired. I thought that if we started at the beginning of the year, it would just be too much of a rush. So... And if the halftime person, if that halftime person could split the time, like Alder Person Yuds was saying, with another community in the, through the innovation fund and the pilot program, if that could happen, and other individuals that are still staffed would be able to do uh, what they're doing now, would that be enough? Right, and there isn't anything preventing us from from uh, uh, making effort to. Uh, participate in some way of innovating and, and working with, you know, whether it's Horicon or, or uh, a close neighbor. Um, uh, the, the one comment that I would make is, is again, uh, with the amount of workload that needs to be done, the question is, is can it be done uh, in less time than the, the 20, 80 hours, right? Um, so, uh, that's that's another that's another thought process chief just a question is this a does this need to be a union position the way i have it proposed um, is a union position um one of the biggest reasons that i would like to attract some of one of our union members um to actually take the position they're already trained they know the code um they know the community they know the owners there'd be very little training involved um but at the end of the day does it have to be no it doesn't have to but again, it's it's trying to attract the right employee, which is extremely difficult right now. So. so some of the things that I'm hearing is is that even if moving forward with this, you would want us to look into um, uh, ways that we can um, uh, uh, secure the position of the city a little bit further uh, versus uh, necessarily making the position itself as as attractive um uh to to the employee um and if possible there'd be interest in us looking at trying to uh make this uh an innovation grant um type program i will tell you that the the city is meeting with um with the county on some other uh ways that we are trying to uh, uh we're not not turning a blind eye to this innovation grant um you know Part of it is, is we're still waiting on on information from the state mm -hmm. um, and what counts and what doesn't count. Um, but that wouldn't prohibit us from from looking into this uh, in the future. Um, and just, you know, this is exactly the conversation I was hoping we would have tonight <laughs> because we had more conversation tonight on this position than we did at the workshop. <laughs> so um, 
uh, forgive me for forcing forcing entertainment of, of an action but even if you guys came back and uh, uh, i would i would welcome an a, a motion and even if you amended that would be that would be at least direction for us as staff um i still feel and still re recommend this moving forward um but i'm i i hear your concerns loud and clear mayor and we can definitely um uh we understand that we need to do some things to to make this uh, position uh, something that uh, has has full support. Or even if it is a position that's outsourced again, I just the shared revenues is a great thing, and uh, you know that was a huge opportunity for our community and community communities across the state. It's not going to continue to you know happen at massive levels, and if we eat up a lot of the budget going forward, we won't, you know, we'll run into the same problems eventually. So I, I hesitate on adding positions that will hurt us in the future. Yes, Alder person. Um, I have a question for the chief. You said that we do between what, 48 and 53% of the inspections we're supposed to do. Yeah. Are these inspections that are mandated by state law or when you say, and then is, do we are we penalized or is there any kind of check on our whether we're doing these inspections and is there any kind of legal liability if we don't do these inspections? Yeah, so they are required by the Department of Safety and Professional Services. Um, we are required to do them, and then we are required to um, to affirm that we've we've completed them. Um, if we do get audited at some point, um, we risk losing our two percent dues. Um, which would equate to roughly ninety-five thousand dollars for the city. Well, for the city of Beaverdam and the township, so all of our township partners um, would also lose all of their two percent dues, not just the money they give us. Um, the other thing that we would lose then is the state actually pays for our uh, our training, so they pay for all of our fire classes for all of our all of our people. Um, we'd lose the ability to participate in that program also. And if we're not doing the inspections we're supposed to be doing, do we as, uh, does the city have any legal liability if like a fire would happen and there was not an inspection that was supposed to have taken place? That I can't really comment on, I don't know. If it's yeah, it's a, it's a tough question. I mean, I don't know if anyone's ever brought a suit like that. I mean, yeah, it, it falls on the property owner to comply with ordinances. If we we do the inspections just to make sure that they are complying with fire codes, but it's ultimately their responsibility. I, I guess I can tell you that um, before I was here, I mean, I, I think everybody's aware of where the Green Giant property is, but um, we did in the past, um, we wrote them up for um, for some violations pertaining to their, uh, their sprinkler system. Um, and as luck would have it, there was a fire, the sprinkler system didn't work. And um, that was something that State Fire Marshal um, did communicate to us was um, that we need to do a better job of following up on those type of things because um, obviously it was written up, but we just, we, especially at that time, we didn't have the, the people to actually follow up on everything, so. Yes, Alderperson Fisher. I have a question, Mayor. <clears throat> if we were to postpone this decision on a full-time uh, fire inspector for a year, that would give us some time to research some of the ideas that you've and Jack and the rest of us have come up with. What is, what do you need uh, a motion? Uh, in other words, I guess my question is when do we decide whether or not we want to add this position or not, or postpone it? Uh, what's the process? Do we wait until after the public hearing? Or can we do it now tonight? Uh, that's what you're asking for. That's what I'm asking for. So if you guys came back and you said, hey, we want to postpone the decision on this. The only comment that I would make is is where the 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 savings that you would have for postponing it a year is I would apply it to uh, reduce the amount of state trust fund that we'd use. Uh, and so it wouldn't necessarily change the the dollar amount. Uh, well, no, it would change the dollar amount for, but it's going to be minimal. It's it's going to be like, yeah, it'll be like 10 cents. <laughs> um, uh, 
on that that 366. So, um, but that's what that's the type of that's the direction staff is looking for. So, um, and if that's the only thing in the the recommended request, then well, do do I make a motion now to postpone this for a year, and do we vote on it now, or does do you just remove it and we vote on the entire package? Can we vote on line, vote on line items at this point in time? You could, yes. Well, then I'll make a motion that we remove it this year to give us some time to uh, look this over for next year's budget. And I'll put that in the form of a motion. Okay, so we have a motion on the floor. Is there a second? Alderperson Yuntz. I'll second that. Thank you, Alderperson Yuntz. Comments or discussion on the amendment? I Yes, all the persons up. Support of it that he made, uh, Chief made the case that we're not meeting our obligations. Um, we risk losing essentially more in state funds if we get audited, right? So we're on the hook for losing upwards of $100,000 if we get audited and we lose this position. So that can happen at any time. And we have an example of a pretty big fire that happened because we're not meeting our obligations already. Um, so I I would be in favor of, of keeping it. There was an argument about whether or not this position should be union or not. I would be interested in hearing more about that because things might change and whether or not 10, 15, 20 years from now, we need to reduce staff at the fire department. Well, this could be an option if it's not union. I guess I'd be interested in that. But overall, I'd like to see it um, retained. So. If it is retained, otherwise, how about opening it up to the possibility of outsourcing it then as well? Right, right. I, I would, I would be open to that as well. I think it that it doesn't to need be, to be a city employee. Right, it needs to be filled. I would like to see it filled. I don't care how it's filled. I would like to see it filled. <laughs> Alder Person Fisher. I think that's what I'm saying. I agree with you 100%. We should do something about it, but I don't think we should rush into this with a union position that we cannot just simply next year say, well, let's go back. There's no going back from this. And and mind you, we have have a half year. So uh, one thing I would comment, though, is that there's the Police and Fire Commission who's involved in this too as well, right? So, um, and I don't, I honestly, Rick, I don't know how that <laughs> necessarily would work with optional powers. Um, but I mean, the the council could say, hey, we want to move forward with this. You've got a half year to fi figure something out and, and bring it back to us for approval. Or like Mick suggested, we could push it off a year or two as well. I mean, that's those. I just want to make sure that we're aware that there is a half year already built in uh, to this to this conversation. Yeah, and the Police and Fire Commission, that does get a little with the optional powers, they do have more authority than a general police and fire commission, which would just have the sort of employment related powers. Um, I mean, basically, if you allocate this money, it's. They can use it however they want. Yes. Mm -hmm. Even if you specify. I, <laughs> I think you would. It would be a tough argument to make, I guess. If could, it's... could the money be set into a general fund of a, you know, for exploration of a of a possible position, and it doesn't go to the PFC to the fire department, Kayla? I mean, could they move that amount into kind of like what our, our fund balance would be, and then at some point vote to then reallocate those budgeted funds to the fire department or to yes source so what the pfc the 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 pfc um they're beholden to the budget you set um and they can't obligate the council uh, so the one the one area that you've got at least as i understand it rick you can correct me if i'm wrong the one benefit of your position that you have right now is that it is a half position and so um, the council does have um, some say in 
what we can guarantee in the future, right, for a budget. And and the PFC can't come back and say, well, we need more money for, for staffing. The budget's what you give them, right? Um, if we say that it's a contractual basis, that actually puts, I think, more um, authority on the PFC because they do have that direct right um, and authority over how they use contractual dollars. Um, versus, uh, versus employment, like, uh, uh, a union contract needs to have council approval, doesn't necessarily need to have PFC approval, but it does need to have council approval, um, because it's future years. I don't know if I confused that, that topic, but what I'm trying to say is that, uh, I think you have some authority here, um, it just it gets into a gray area. Yeah, it, that that's the thing. It just gets into a very gray area. I mean, you provide them the budget; they have to work within that budget. Um, you know, one thing. It is one strategy is obviously to leave it out, and then you can always amend the budget and add it back in in a few months. That would require a two thirds vote for a budget amendment. Um, but that. That's the option, I guess, is you can either designate now or choose to add it in the future. We could set aside the funds and then vote in the future to determine where it goes. Correct. Alder person was hell. Need some clarification then, maybe from Kayla or whoever. Um, so we're saying right now that the cost for the half year is 54000 we're also saying that we have revenue of 44,000 to go toward that. But where is that revenue coming from? That, that so that was additional EMS revenue that was included in the uh, fee schedule for this year. Uh, so that is something that's where when I mentioned the additional EMS revenue before, that's something historically we have not done a good job of is actually um, reviewing that and making adjustments. I believe prior to 2000 may of 22 we hadn't done one in four or five years uh, so we did we did fall quite behind um but that is something now that um we are reviewing every year so um you know hopefully that is something that as our our uh costs continue to to increase we can you know, keep up with the uh with the fees so so regardless of what we do with the fire inspector position we're still going to have that revenue for that position, yes, that would be correct. Right. Though no, we'll just have that revenue. It's not specific to that position. That's correct. Correct. Yeah. That's yeah. what we're yeah. saying. Yeah. Well, you just said for that position. Yeah, for for this position. The other positions are it's not it's they're not as they're they're more tied, they're more interchangeable. Could I just go ahead? So the so I understand what you had said with, with Rick. Um six months from now or whenever from now we decide to fund this it ultimately comes down to the public service commission determining how and who they're going to hire essentially right like we give them the money and they decide so it really this conversation that we're having is sort of no unless i mean what Rick, can we actually do to the public uh we have C to say you, you hire this Rick's, person this we way. set aside the fund. you could stick it in you could stick it in administration to to um, it's it, not specified under under the fire department. It's okay. just put in a unspecified fund, whatever we administration that we want to label it. And then a couple months within a couple months, you said, Rick. Well, you can amend your budget anytime. Um, so, like in a few months, if let's say the PFC comes back and they've got yeah. a specific proposal for you, that's acceptable. You could amend the budget and add. That and we money take that the money and say, "Here you go. You okay. can do that." Yeah, I should say move, not add. Okay. But it's yeah. reallocated. That seems like a fair way yeah. to know what the other hand's going to do. Right. Okay. Uh, older, older person Anderson. What happens to those funds if they never get allocated anywhere? Are they free for the picking by a certain no. special interest on in the city? No. Um, <laughs> I, I appreciate I appreciate the the confidence. Um. <laughs> forgive the sarcasm um uh 
Well, what I will say is that, for instance, this year we had we uh, in 2022, right? We or sorry, 2023 and uh, in, in the 2022 process budgeting for this year, we um, established a, a contingency line item, right? Um, we have not. We've we've left that money alone. We haven't needed that contingency. Um, and um, the thought process at the time when we talked about it was to build our fund reserves, right? If you'll recall. Um, and so you could easily put it there if you wanted to uh, for the interim um, and give direction to the PFC to bring forward a, a proposal um, over the next six months. I think that that's, that's a fair, um, fair thought process. Um, but I, I, can, I can guarantee you I want to keep my job, Ken. And so, uh, you know, there's, there's any time if you want to... <laughs> Freedom of Information Act, or just want to come and stop in my office, I can show you the accounts and we can go over things. So, Alder Person's So, do we need to amend? So, we have the a motion by uh, Alder Fisher to remove this uh, line item. Would would we need to amend that to say hold hold this funds until we give the PFC four months or six months to come back to us and say, show us what you're going to do in six months. And we will then determine if we're going to fund you or not. I think if Alder person Fisher would. I would like willing. to keep it simple. I have a motion on the floor. I'd like to have that motion voted on. I have a second on it. And uh, my feeling is why go through all the extra steps of putting this money into separate accounts and then deciding whether or not we're going to go. Listen, we got we got a year. Let's put this aside for a year. We've been doing it for you just said we've been behind on on our inspections for how many years? I don't think another year is going to kill us here. But this will give us the time to think it over, make the right decision whether it's going to be union, non-union, private, uh, city employee, how you want to do it. But uh, let the PFC get involved in this. Maybe they can come up with some ideas on how they would like it done because we haven't heard a word from them on this that I know of. So my motion stands. I have a second on it. And I'd like okay. To call Is it there up. any other discussion? I just want to bring one point <laughs> and, okay. and not to, to belabor the topic, but just, you know, PFC has reviewed the request by both the police and the fire. Um, and they they did recommend these things moving forward. So they've reviewed at least. I don't want you to feel like uh, they have not that th these requests don't have their blessing. Um, but, but but I think that I, I just wanted <laughs> only to only because you bring it up. They have not considered these ideas in outsourcing. And when I have spoken with uh, the the PFC uh, chair, he was open to that. So. Let's just postpone it for a year and okay. vote is there on any this other discussion there. on the amendment? Is there anything you need to bring forward on the amendment, Chief? I, I just want to agree with Mick on this one. I think uh, it'll give us some time to see what the PFC brings forward. We'll have time to do our own research on a third party, if that makes sense, uh, or even collaborating with other communities. So I think the time will be well uh, deserved to, to just take our time. So I'm agreeing with uh, the amendment. Anything else on the amendment? Is this motion or is there no, your amendment. And My motion is it's just a motion. He didn't have an amendment. Oh, OK. Right, because there is no. Yeah. Okay, so what was the motion maybe from Ms. Farron, if you want to tell us? Um, the motion was to amend the budget to remove the uh, fire department inspector uh, position for one year. Okay. Okay. Any questions on that amendment? Okay. Hearing none, if you vote yes, you're agreeing to hold off on that position for one year. If you vote no, you keep it in. Yes. I don't like the way I just heard that. Okay. Um, can you say that again? We're not we're not delaying it for the position for one year. We're delaying the decision right. of how to fill the position. So we're giving if, the one year 
buffer to figure out options. Okay, and just so we're not saying in one year it's automatically going to happen. Okay, very good. Good good call. Okay, vote yes. You're wanting to delay so that there's time to work on that for the year. If you vote no, you're saying it stands <laughs> as is. If you could call the roll, please. Anderson. Aye. Appenfeld. No. Bonnet. No. Burnett. Aye. Fisher. Aye. Keel. No. Mark. No. Olson. Aye. Perkins. No. Wissell. Aye. Yads. Aye. Zop. No. Seems to be a tie. It's a tie. So the mayor votes yes. So that uh, piece will go back to the PFC for consideration. Other comments for direction to Nathan and staff then on the rest of the presentation. So I'll need a motion to move this forward. Alderperson Fisher. I'll move, I'll make the motion to move this forward. Is there a second? Alderperson Burnett? Any more discussion? I'm moving this forward to public. Hearing none, please call the roll. Appenfelt? Aye. Burnett? Aye. Burnett? Aye. Fisher? Aye. Keel? Aye. Mark? Aye. Olson? Aye. Perkins? Aye. Wasal? Aye. Yads? Aye. Sop? Aye. Anderson? Aye. Hey, thank you. Appreciate, appreciate the conversation. This was good. Um, and the direction. Uh, so moving on, uh, we're going to go through the CIP. Um, so last year, uh, background, we established the 65% debt capacity cap. Currently, we're at 52, uh, almost 53%, um, and a policy cap of annual borrowing of, of 4 million to reduce the total geo debt uh, over time. In five years, we'll probably be closer to about that 45%, if you'll recall. Um, we also, uh, over this time, we've increased capital program. Uh, our, our increased dollars that we've been funding in the capital program has improved the street pacer rating score. Um, city committed $2.2 million towards equipment in 2023 um, to be borrowed in 2024. Uh, during the workshop, the direction for the capital improvement plan uh, were several items. One, we wanted to maintain the cap of the new debt to $4 million and reduce our dependence on debt service. Uh, there was a preference for street rehab over completing a street one, uh, one street reconstruction project. There was preference in incremental changes to improve the city's capital plan and position. Um, there was desire to better understand the time required to shift the PACER rating curve. Uh, and then finally, reevaluate equipment replacement program for an inventory of, of, of items that are 300,000 or less. So we're going to review that tonight. Um, cause we've, we've done those things. So if you go to the next slide, Todd, uh, this just gives us an overview of the general CIP. Um, you'll see that we kept the debt service to the 4 million. Um, the other funding sources is 707,000. Uh, the hunt, you'll see the 150,000. That's the transfer from the general fund, right? To, um, support, uh, street rehab. Um, basically transportation aids, the gains that we made in transportation aids. Um, the 107 is a grant that we received for uh, an ambulance. The 400,000 is the straight state trust fund. 
Um, and then uh, finally, uh, the 50,000 is some, some funds that we have uh, in the foundation for uh, the Swan Park uh, design. Um, our, I would note that the million dollars, the we, we basically, we had originally $2 million for both street rehab and also uh, a reconstruction project. Now it's just the million dollars and that's for street rehab alone. Um, the rotary wall is still in the CIP. I know that that was an important conversation that we had at the workshop. So I wanted to just review, going to the next slide, review the PACER rating. Um, and I wanted to add just a little bit more flavor to help with understanding timing. So if you notice at the bottom, I've added two arrows. The blue arrow, the maintenance arrow, everything that's five to five to that nine ten is in your maintenance program. It's maintainable streets. We can do surface repair to it, and the roads will will continue to function. If it hits that three four, now it's starting to deteriorate the base, right? And we're going to need to do reconstruction. Um, there was a question on what if we just kept maintaining what we currently do, what would happen to the curve? And we're going to show you that. So if you click the slide, um, Todd, this is the curve the way it was in the past. Um, uh, previous to, um, you know, our, our capital program, if you will, of where we're actually doing 2 million plus grants a year. Um, you click the slide again. We're showing you where the curve is currently. Um, and remember this curve, because this will be kind of important. We'll I'll illustrate this in the future. This is where we're at currently. And if we continue to just do the mi minimum that we're doing right now, the uh, we're averaging about 2 million. This year we went to 1 million, but on average we were doing 2 million. You're not going to move the curve much from this spot. Finally, the ideal is to get us completely under the maintenance program because it's going to be less expensive. So the way you can think about it is this. Maintenance is half the street. The base is the other half. If we're having to repair both, we're doubling our costs. Everybody, that makes sense? So if we go to the next slide. Um, the next slide really illustrates this fairly well. So we showed you a capital recovery plan, the ideal where we're doing maintenance, concrete maintenance and asphalt maintenance. And Todd did some, some good math. He figured out what it would cost us uh, to continue to repair or to maintain a concrete street over and maintain it for the 50 year life. And basically it comes out to be about $2 million of repairs for all our concrete streets. For our asphalt streets, in order to maintain the 20 year life cycle on all our asphalt streets, it would cost about 38 million. So the annual recovery cost is about 2 million again. So combined, we would need to spend four million just to maintain all our streets in the maintainable section in that five to 10 range, if that makes sense. Now, if we were to go the opposite way where we didn't do maintenance, we just did reconstruction. We let things go until their useful life was, was done. You can see the impact all our streets combined, concrete estimated value is about 158 million. 50 years is very, very liberal. We'll say liberal in how long that road will last. It will definitely be a one after 50 years if we don't do any maintenance to it. And we'll probably hear a lot of complaining. But it would cost us $3 million a year to in annual cost to do reconstruction. Asphalt. Similarly, it would cost us about six million. So our total cost would be nine million. So you can see that by doing the reconstruction, we're basically doubling our cost plus some, if that makes sense. Um, so if you go to the next slide. Our current average spend is about two million plus grants on maintenance and reconstruction. That's gotten us to where our curve is today. To achieve and maintain a maintenance schedule, 
will require 4 million minimum. Staff estimate 50 plus years to reach the median rate of seven to eight, that seven to eight curve, the ideal. And the reason why is because it's gonna take 50 years for all the roads to cycle through. Plus also at 4 million, the 4 million is really taking care of the maintainable roads, right? Um, getting the roads that are in the threes and fours, we still have to reconstruct those to get it into the maintainable. So um, when we look at this next bullet point, um, it may help to illustrate this a little bit better. Of the streets rated eight or less, okay, the streets that need some type of maintenance, 56% are in the maintainable range. 44 are in the reconstruction range. To maintain the maintainable, if we just take the 4 million, it's about 50% divided in half, we need to at least have 2 million just to maintain the maintainable. So if we're doing an average of 2 million right now, we're not touching really the reconstruction. Does that make sense? So um, that's why it will take us 50 some odd years plus to get to get to that seven to eight range. And mind you, the reason we wanna be in that seven to eight range is because it is less expensive, right? Half the cost. Um, so again, um, not to belabor, let's move on to the capital. Um, you guys asked us to evaluate a $300,000 vehicle and equipment program. So we did that, we put, applied that metric to the inventory and basically it reduced the capital recovery cost from the 1.27 annual to about 767 that we would need to be putting forward every year. And if we look at it this year, we put it, we're putting in 2.2 plus, right? Because of the fire truck, right? Well, the fire truck doesn't count anymore. So let's, let's scratch that, but we've got We've got about uh, 250 for, for some, or about 500 for some trucks in the CIP. And then we have the 500,000 that we just implemented, or you guys just acted on with the equipment replace or the equipment and capital that we approved in the, in the new request. So if we go to the next slide, these are the 2024 steps. This is the incremental change that we're, we're recommending or that I'm recommending. Doesn't need action tonight, um, but I think everybody's in agreement, but I wanna make sure we're all on the same page. We're transferring the 150,000 of general revenue to support street rehab and reduce our dependence on debt. I want to grow that over time, right? Um, so that we can get to the 4 million, right? So if we're not gonna grow debt, then we need to fill the hole somehow. And so we're going to have to start taking, chipping away at our general fund to, to pay for it. We built in this year 459 in general revenue to support vehicle and equipment. That 459 that, that we approved tonight, that's not debt. That's, that's general fund, right? So that gets us moving in the right direction where we're reducing our dependence on debt uh, in the future gets us closer to that 700,000. Um, so, and then finally, as we go forward this year, I'm not asking you to act on anything tonight, but my intent is, is to establish a vehicle and equipment replacement program that builds reserves over time with an annual, any annual surplus. So it's one thing to have an in and an out, right? We can just put, we can just take the 500 or the 459,000 and it's in, but we're spending it right away. The hope is, is that we create a pool, a savings account, if you will, so that some years when things fluctuate, where I may have, you know, $800,000 in requests, I'll have a pool to draw from rather than going to you and asking you for $800,000 in, in, in general fund revenue. And instead, we'll just continue to contribute the 767, right? But another year, I might have only $500,000 of requests. I'll still contribute my 767 and we'll refill the pool, right? So it, you're, we're creating a savings account for us to finance rather than us issue debt and us um, issue have to pay interest on top of it. We're now having a fund balance that also helps our debt rating, 
right? Gives us a better debt rating because we've got more fund balance. But also, um, we now have funds that are in savings that can be earning interest, right? So that's that's the intent. The inventory, uh, so we'll build the reserves over time with annual surplus. So if we have annual surplus this year, one thing that this policy that we'll be proposing in the future is to use those surpluses and let's let's designate them towards this this pool, this uh, savings account. Inventory will be based on the three hundred thousand dollar or less, and then annually recognize and build into the budget recovery costs or a savings plan as items are replaced. So we don't necessarily need to go from uh, five hundred thousand to. 700 tomorrow, we can build that over time as we replace items as we go, if that makes sense. Any questions? Okay. Next two slides are going to review our debt service. So just to give you a peace of mind, our debt per capita, we're right around in the mid range compared to some comparables, both those in the region and those that are are uh, similar similar populations. That's our total debt per capita. And I would just point out, <laughs> yep, since Wapan is on there and they look quite low, they get they get in their budget. I I believe it's in their budget over a million dollars more a year in shared revenue because of the prison. And that goes into their budget. Just so you know that. Yep, and also their per capita is a little bit inflated because it's also including their <laughs> prisoners, right? So, but um, if we go to the next slide, this is what you look like on your annual average new debt per capita. So when we look at your debt issuance per year, the 4 million over the last, well, it's not 4 million over the last 10 years, it's more like 5 million over the last 10 years, but you're not outside of the range either. Um, you're kind of in the, the middle ground. Um, and those that are on the low end are, are, are definitely smaller municipalities. But that's just to give you peace of mind. It's just provide co comparables. Um, moving on to the next slide, utilities. Um, and I'll go quick because we need to get Eller still on. Um, the workshop direction for utility funds, uh, you preferred modest annual rate increases. Ellers was to prevent the rate or present the rate case for the water fund and staff to present rate increases for storm and wastewater. In 2022 wastewater study that we did proposed a 25% increase. What we brought in the fee schedule was only a 5% increase, but the thought process is that we're going to need to have a little bit more than just a modest 2% in order to catch up over time for that 25%. The 2021 stormwater rate increase of 26% covered operations plus 200,000 in capital. Um, I think Zach spent a lot of time bringing that forward and, and sharing that with you. Um, but on average, our, our capital uh, needs are about 600 plus, 600,000 plus. And part of that's due to some TMDL, uh, is that the right acronym, TMDL, which if you ask Todd, he can tell you what the acronym means. I don't know to this day, but we need to have stormwater because of state regulations and DNR. Uh, the fee schedule that you're going to review later on tonight resolution includes a 5% rate increase for both storm and wastewater. Now, if we go to the next slide, I just want to show you what wastewater fund rate impact will be. And also the following slide will be the stormwater fund in rate impact. And I think you'll notice that they're, they're fairly modest. Um, and you may even think that um, they're, they're insufficient. <laughs> so with what we're proposing at 5%, the change in wastewater would be about $3 for the average user, which uses about 13 units um, per, is it per quarter, Jeremy? Yep. So their their total bill would be sixty three fifty eight minus the three dollars. What they are paying today is sixty, right? You can look where our rates are compared to our comparables. We're the lowest. Even if we were to do the twenty five percent, we wouldn't outpace Wapan. Moving on. 
stormwater fund rate impact, the 5% is basically a dollar. It changes things from $20 to $21 per quarter. We're on the low end compared to many of the comparables. Mind you that they're not the same comparables because not everybody that we had on the previous list has a stormwater fund. But even if we were to do the 15% of $3, we would still be one of the lowest tier um, on there. That 15% would take care of the, the 600,000 or it would be about 500,000. It would be close. That concludes my presentation. If there are any questions, I can take them at this time. Sorry, I don't remember. I'm asking this question if I should know this. So are you asking for the 5% or the 25? The five the five percent is included in the the, in the, proposal. the proposed rate, the uh proposed fee schedule. I just wanted to give you um the the maximum that we would actually be asking and, and show you that we're doing what you asked us to do, which is incremental change. So mm -hmm. and even if we were to do the maximum, it's incremental change. Right. But um for all intents and purposes, uh but if we now moving forward go up the five percent yearly, or do you have to come back every year and say, "Can we do the five percent?" Uh, no, we we would be bringing it in the fee schedule. That would be the intent and plan as we'd be bringing it. If you gave me direction further on in the workshop that you wanted to see uh, a modest increase, or if between now and the, yeah, we we can talk about that. But what we're asking tonight is the five percent. Any other questions? Can you, you want a motion on this to take that forward or are you good with it? Unless there are any concerns or objections, uh, we'll be bringing this same proposed budget to you. The utilities will be being brought to you the in the first week in December. I think from everybody's uh, countenance that you're satisfied. <laughs> uh, yes, Alderperson Burnett. I just think that we should acknowledge the work that Nathan and the group did to present all this. This is a lot of work in this document. So thank, thank you. you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And thanks to um, Chief Wesley and, and your work. I think that uh, I just want to let you know that people, um, I think it, my understanding is, is we want to see some resolution. It's what the resolution is to the, the problem and want some options. So uh, I appreciate your you know, thoughts and work on all of this too. And it's not that we don't support you. Um, we we want to see that happen for you as well. All right. All right. Then we're going to move on to agenda item number 10, presentation by Brian Raymer, representing Ellers Public Finance Advisors and Action regarding water utility cash flow and rate case study. Hello, can you all Hello. hear me? Can you all hear me? Yes, we're impressed that you know when to come in, uh, that you were following this whole long discussion. <laughs> I would listen to budget presentations every day. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I do that for my job, so. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Something's so wrong. To... <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> that's, probably, that's probably true. Just I'm going to try to share my screen here. So excited to hear from you. <laughs> thank you. And, and thank you for having me. Um, Thanks let for me know if this is sharing on screen for you all. Yes, it is. Okay. So I'm here tonight to kind of speak to the water utility. And we were engaged with the city um, to look at the water rates. Um, phase one of our analysis is what we label a long run long range cash flow analysis and the intent of the long range cash flow analysis is to look 5 years at least um, into history and then look 10 years into the future one of the primary reasons for that is just respecting that utilities operate a little bit different than your governmental funds and that it operates more like a business where you're providing a service to your customers and then charging them a fee in order to provide that service one of the most important things to realize is that this service 
is providing round the clock, all year round, 24 hours a day, 365, safe drinking water to your customers. So in order to do that, it does cost a lot of money to get those assets in the ground and in the air. Um, and it also costs a lot of money to maintain those assets. So we typically see some uh, high volatility as it relates to your day-to-day -day expenses or what we label as operating and maintenance expenses, often referred to as O and M. Um, but this operating and maintenance expense can be quite volatile for all of your maintenance categories and therefore the need for the historical rate performance. So we did provide city staff with um, you know, higher level tables um, in terms of this full analysis um, that would then take our historical rate performance and provide future projections as to considerations for how to adjust rates. And then finally, we'll kind of review the rate impact. But the reason this is paramount for water utilities is because you are regulated in the state of Wisconsin by the Public Service Commission, uh, which I'll refer to for the remainder of this uh, presentation as the PSC. So one of the first questions we always get, of course, uh, completing one of these analysis is, do we need a rate adjustment? And the item to look at is to understand that the PSC basically has a math equation that determines um, what your rates should be. This math equation changes annually. Um, they say you need to recover three costs of your system. These are highlighted on this slide uh, by the various sections of each bar for each year. So the orange section is your O&M expenses. Again, understand that there is some volatility as it relates to maintenance expenses primarily. Sometimes that can be due to salaries though. If there's a pos position unfilled or a new position attained within the utility that could certainly change these O&M expenses. Second category of costs that the PSC would like you to recover is called depreciation. That's a mathematical formula to basically say what's the annual amount of dollars that we should be recovering in order to replace our existing assets. And then the third cost category is what is called rate of return. Uh, this is a little bit more mythical in nature, um, only in that the PSC has decided that all utilities within the state should recover the same percentage of rate of return. And that is on the value of your undepreciated assets in your system. So a lot of fun uh, financial words there to basically say, you got to recover three costs in your system, net of other revenues you may have like interest earnings, or uh, forfeited discounts or other charges that are not named water uh, rates um, can go against those expenses to give you what is called the revenue requirement or to answer the question, where should our rates be year over year? That is shown in the purple line that's identified on this slide. And then the goal would be to have our user rates be at or above um, this line each year. Um, one of the items in terms of understanding that you are a regulated utility is that each year this mathematical equation that changes um, and the fact that it's due to um, a rate of return on the assets of your system as you execute capital projects that increases the value of your system, therefore increases the amount of uh, rate of return that the PSC would like you to collect. One simple you know, item on this is that you can kind of see over the years, this stays a little steady. However, in recent years, um, that has grown. The reason for that is the rate of return is tied to interest rates in that they want utilities to have this rate of return to basically say you may have some sort of debt outstanding and interest costs, you should be recovering that. However, again, benchmarked to the entire state. So to answer the question, do we need a rate adjustment in the eyes of the PSC? That answer is yes, your rates are behind their mathematical equation. The next slide identifies how do we increase rates? So the PSC only allows uh, utilities and for the city's utility, two windows of opportunity. 
One is called a simplified rate case, which is basically an inflationary adjustment that they set annually. And if you qualify, you can go for this uh, inflationary adjustment. Historically, it's around 3%. This year, the light bulb and inflation turned on in Madison and they realized, oh, inflation's a little higher. So it is 8%. I say light bulb, but facetiously only to say that you know, inflation has been a little outpacing their benchmark rate of return until this year, or excuse me, their inflationary increase until this year. Um, so it's good that they finally recognize there's this, you know, increasing costs within utilities, um, but it may be a little late. Uh, the other item as it relates to being a little late would be you're only eligible for a certain window of time because the city is what's called a class AB utility, which is just a metric that says, based on the number of customers you have, you are in this utility class. And because you are in this utility class, you only get five years from the last time your last conventional rate case, which is the other window of opportunity to adjust rates. But for a simplified, you only get five years from, from that last conventional rate case to adjust rates on this inflationary basis. The city is no longer eligible due to that, meaning you are outside of your five-year window to use the inflationary adjustment. So the window of opportunity to adjust rates from now until you complete your next conventional rate case is this conventional rate case, which is essentially the time to go into the PSC and they review and audit all of the information from the utility from the last time you completed this, work their PSC math, and say, these are what your rates should be. You can go in for this at any time, um, but on the right-hand side of this chart, you will note we have crunched the numbers to basically say, well, we estimate a conventional rate case going in at this time would yield in terms of an increase. That is about 33%. Of course, it's important to understand where that kind of puts you in terms of this cash flow. Is this something that is uh, needed? Is this something that will provide us protection for you know future obligations as we you know go in time? And so this slide is identified as your 10-year long-range cash flow, top to bottom. It works revenues against expenses. And then in the middle, you kind of see what you have available for debt. We've identified the uh, existing debt profile of the city here. And then the city staff has worked to provide their capital improvement plan for the water utility. And Ellers as your municipal advisor has provided opinion on uh, potential funding mechanisms, whether it be cash, debt, or other, in order to fund the CIP in the instance where debt service was needed. Um, we have provided a debt schedule um, structured around your existing debt. So we're trying to keep this debt profile as level as possible um, within this plan. Uh, the goal of that, of course, is to make sure that we do not you know, push ourselves into a higher rate, rate adjustment need. Um, so with that, you can kind of see how this 33% provides annual cash flow here as our numbers are in the black kind of into the future. The one thing I will mention and we'll kind of get to later is, you know, the question of, is this rate adjustment needed at this time? Um, you do have, you know, a healthy cash position currently against our benchmarks. We can go into that benchmarking analysis if you would like. The one thing I would point out, however, is without this extra revenue, this picture looks much more bleak. So the 33% provides about a million dollars in our estimation of additional revenue. Um, and without that, you would see a lot of red um, going into the future. And um, in the scenario that we built, not doing the rate adjustment and just kind of waiting to say, when is the last time we would absolutely need this would be 2026. Essentially the utility would run out of cash under this capital improvement program and under the assumptions for day-to-day uh, -day operating expenses or the o &M expenses. So um, that is to say, you should definitely do something by 2026. It's unfortunate that your only window of opportunity right now is the conventional rate case. And the projected result is the 
percent adjustment. So what does that impact look like on an average residential bill? Understand we've made some presumptions in terms of an average residential customer being one with a five eighths inch or three quarters inch meter and that they use about 12,000 gallons per quarter or 1600, just north of 1600 cubic feet uh, per quarter. So your current rates are slated in you know, the early years here. And then we've provided what potentially the rate adjustment looks like um, to those new rates in terms of a volumetric rate and the fixed charges that you receive on your quarterly water bill and what that impact would be. So uh, the one item being is since your current quarterly bill uh, for this average residential user is under $100, the percent to dollar ratio is less than one to one. Therefore, 33% would impact a quarterly bill, about $29, uh, just short of $29.50, or about $118 annually in terms of what that impact would look like to customers. Um, in evaluating kind of where does that put us by comparison, um, we can run comparisons by a plethora of uh, you know, different comparison groups. Um, it is very hard to kind of pinpoint what's the appropriate group. Um, typically we wanna see what our neighbors are doing. So that's kind of the approach we've taken here is looking at a comparison in terms of Dodge County and utilities within the county. Um, however, it should be seen and understood that you know, you may experience different uh, treatment expenses or pumping expenses um, than your neighbors. Um, one explicit example of this would be, you know, a utility based on where they get their source water may have different contaminants that they may need to treat and get rid of than their neighbor, even though they're only, you know, a mile or five miles down the road. Um, it's all a matter of what makes sense for your system and then ultimately understanding what is the appropriate timing for these uh, adjustments in the regulated environment that we are. So looking at this comparison right now in Dodge County, we're about you know, three quarters of the way down on the list in terms of you know, cheapest rates. And this is sorted by 12,000 gallon usage. Um, that's kind of the typical metric that the PSC identifies based off of uh, billing data that they have from utilities. The 33%, you know, would uh, make you jump a couple of utilities and, you know, put you just above about 50% of the list. Um, the one other thing here that's identified on the right-hand portion of the screen would be your, um, ultimately, the effective date. And one thing to kind of pay attention to there is other utilities that may be below you but may have not adjusted rates in the near term are likely doing so, um, you know, at some, at some point in time. Um, the other thing would be to understand that other class AB utilities in the county, Watertown being the only other one, um, you know, they would be outside their five-year window as well. So they're like likely seeing the pressure of this regulatory environment um, sometime in the near future as well. Looking at all of the financial ramifications in terms of the limited options available, you know, we would recommend that you move forward with the conventional rate case sometime in the near future, understanding that this process typically takes about eight to 10 months from green lighting it to rates being implemented. Um, so as to say, this is not as simple as, um, you know what Nathan just walked through on the wastewater and stormwater side where you can update your fee schedule, pass a resolution, here we go. Um, there is a significant amount of work in terms of the application required uh, to the PSC, as well as uh, data, data request portion with the PSC. And then also there's, you know, identifiers in terms of navigating, you know, what, what should we request of the PSC? So the one thing that I will mention is this is based off of all of today's knowledge um, at the point at which um, if we were engaged to complete uh, the conventional rate case uh, process with the city, um, we would likely analyze uh, the results of the application 
and make a recommendation in terms of, can we make a request for a lower adjustment outside of the PSC math um, that one, we feel the PSC would be willing to accept, but two, would provide you the financial position needed in order to operate your utility in the long term. You know, we don't want to just say PSC math and go. Um, we make uh, requests commonly um, to go outside of the PSC math only because not all utilities are created, created equal. However, all utilities are benchmarked to the same exact percent rate of return. So in our mind, um, there should be many factors included when adjusting utility rates. Um, however, we just have you know a little bit of a um, hurdle here as it relates to the regulated environment. So then again, if you do have any other rate making goals in terms of you know charges or things you'd like to see, um, this would be the opportune time. Um, if you do go in for a conventional rate case, as that is the only time the PSC kind of allows you to adjust uh, any other charges you would like to. So if you know somebody's been wanting to see some some sort of other charge, um, or you'd like recommendations from Ellers in terms of what other communities are doing for water rate charges, we can certainly make those recommendations. And the one last point I would make on that is that if we are working with the city through this conventional rate case process, um, we would come back to you at the point at which we would complete the application before filing it to the PSC to review potential options as it relates to the impacts of your filing the conventional rate case application with the PSC. So I will leave it at that and open it up for questions. And I can certainly open the other presentation document, which has the full tables if, if that's needed. Um, otherwise, uh, we'll open it for discussion. Thank you, Brian. Any questions? Yes, older person with cell. I just, um, number one, I wanna appreciate your explaining everything as well as you did. There's a lot of uh, acronyms that we certainly don't understand. So mm -hmm. you did a great job of, of introducing that. Uh, with the two different types of rates, um, the simplified you said is a five-year window that's gone. Does, does that come back to us at some point after we do a rated uh, increase? Correct. So let's, a uh, great question. Let's, let's pretend this uh, conventional rate case gets implemented for 1125. Therefore, the simplifieds would be available to you until 112030. So meaning this would kind of be your window um, to increase rates um, up until that five-year window is closed, 112030. And so the recommendation is to increase 33%. Uh, if we chose to increase, I'm just grabbing a number, 10%, uh, does that open the window that we could also increase the, the following four years, 5% each year? Sure. Uh, great question. Let me, uh, let me correct one statement in your question in that the 33% is not necessarily our recommendation for what the utility needs. The intent is to show what the PSC math yields. Um, one primary reason for that is um, no one can unsee numbers. Um, and unfortunately, you know, the PSC would push back in an instance, let's say if, if we were to say on a cash basis, what would the utility need not on the PSC math, that increase might be less. Um, and if this was an unregulated environment, I might say it's, you know, something closer to the um, 15 or I would have to look back to what the cash basis yielded. Give me one second. You know, we might be looking at something closer to like 10% um, to kind of build into this and then, you know, kind of get to these uh, inflationary increases. Um, however, the PSC does not see it that way they're kind of strict on their um, rate of return approach. They'll generally accept something a little bit lighter, but not a lot. Um, so I know that's quite vague and that's the reason that we present it in this manner is so that we can, you know, make sure you understand in terms of once you go in for the application, um, this is probably yielding the near highest result um, in terms of what the PSC math uh, indicates. And then the second to kind of 
go back to the your question of opening the window of opportunity, correct. It doesn't matter what, what the PSC approves um, on the timing perspective for a class AB utility. It's basically the date your rates are improved and implemented. That is the date that starts your five-year clock. So as I see it, uh, when I work with class AB utilities, I never recommend going in for the full PSC benchmark rate of return because if you just happen to have a light maintenance expense here, the financial eligibility criteria may already lose you one year immediately after your rate adjustment, right? Your rates are going to be reset. They're going to be a little bit higher. If you happen to have a light O&M year, um, now you're kind of above your rate of return in terms of the PSC math, therefore not eligible for one of your simplifieds. So it always makes sense for a class AB utility to kind of ask for something lower than the PSC rate of return so as to increase your eligibility for the simplified or the inflationary uh, increase. Unless you have a terrible financial picture um, in which you've been kind of backed into a corner that yields something close to the PSC benchmark rate of return. Again, I always recommend uh, utilities that I work with that are class AB utilities like the city um, to go in for a lower um, than PSC benchmark rate of return. Whether or not you get it can be kind of tough to dictate and also predict. Unfortunately, um, while the formula is robotic, the people working there are not. Um, so um, in one case, they'll approve a lower rate of return and based on the same premise and facts provided to them, uh, they do not um, in other cases. So um, the one the one item that I'd say there is as a class AB utility, if if uh, we are to work with you uh, through the conventional rate cases, I would recommend going in lower than the conventional rate of return, not only to benefit you know the impact um, to your customers, but just because of the regulated nature and and trying to work within the financial you know restraints that the PSC puts on us. So Brian, if I may, the simple answer is, is we don't get a choice. The PSC will dictate what, I mean, we get to massage their thought process, but they're the ones that decide the rate of the rate. Yep. Um, and, and so we can't just say, oh, we want a 10% rate increase, uh, similar to what we did with sewer and stormwater. They're going to say, based on their math, what the rate should be. The longer we delay a rate case, more more likely what's going to happen is that 33% is only going to grow mm -hmm. over time. Correct. Some utilities have have had rate cases, uh, you know, their their uh, uh, traditional rate case might be 50, <laughs> 60%. So uh, just to keep that in mind as well. Yeah. yeah and I do appreciate the comparables uh, to the other communities. The one thing I wanted to just stress that uh, is hasn't been mentioned is um, that Beaver Dam's got soft water. Uh, we have a soft water process, and most of the communities on here do not. So our product is actually better than uh, most of these. Our homeowners able to save from paying for uh, softeners in their homes and the salt that goes with it. So one thing to counsel, we staff are asking for um, uh, action tonight on proceeding forward uh, with the with a rate case. Um, we feel that Brian's done a good job illustrating um, that there there's sufficient need. Um, I would remind you that uh, even if we were to start this this coming year, um, it's not going to take effect. It would not take effect in 2024. It would be it would be in 2025 would be the earliest we would see um, see these rates um, change. But um, in order to move forward with doing a simplified rate increase, right, the, those cases we're going to at some point in time need to take this step. And so uh, we're asking for uh, entertaining a motion to, to proceed forward. All the persons up. I will make a motion for the city to proceed with a full rate case with the Public Service Commission. Second. I'll second that. I also. Okay. <laughs> Any comments or questions? Okay. Uh, hearing none, call the roll, please. 
Burnett? Aye. Burnett? Aye. Fisher? Aye. Keel? Aye. Mark? Aye. Olson? Aye. Perkins? Aye. Wissau? Aye. Yuds? Aye. Zop? Aye. Anderson? No. Eppenfeld? Aye. All right, very good. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Brian. Really uh, do appreciate your time and your presentation and walking us through that. Very, uh, very appreciated. Yes, thank you for having me. Have a good night, everyone. You too, thank you. Okay, we're going to move on to ordinances. Ordinance number 14-2023, an ordinance amending section 62 62-51 weight limits for certain bridges and streets of the Beaverdam Municipal Code. This is a second reading. Because this is a second reading, I'll open it up for public comment. Is there anyone here in attendance or online that would like to speak for or against ordinance number 14-2023? Anyone want to speak uh, regarding ordinance number 14-2023? Whether you're in person or online, we would ask that you speak to ordinance number 14-2023 now. Hearing no public discussion, I'll bring it back for uh, council deliberation. Any comments, questions, concerns regarding ordinance number 14-2023? Alderperson's up. Just a brief commentary. The uh, operations committee did approve this. It is a way to prevent or at least curb the um, unwanted truck traffic coming from or to a Walmart, they they should be using the uh, very nice grade separated County Highway A intersection, and they are taking a shortcut, perceivably down this uh, undersized, underrated uh, city road, and uh, just a way to protect our investments. So. Thank you, and uh, I'm so glad that someone brought that to our attention. That's great. Thank you for um, looking out for the interests of the city as well as uh, people living in that area. Any other comments or questions? Hearing none, please call the roll. Burnett? Aye. Fisher? Aye. Keel? Aye. Mark? Aye. Olson? Aye. Perkins? Aye. Wassell? Aye. Yuds? Aye. Zop? Aye. Anderson? No. Eppenfeld? Aye. Burnett? Aye. Very good. Ordinance does pass. I'm going to um, ask that we take a five minute break and we'll come back and finish the rest of the agenda. Okay. Thank you. 
ordinance number 17-2023. Yes, Alderperson Mark. Um, just a question, and it relates back to the gentleman who spoke during the public comment section. Um, you know, I see the picture of the little tag, I assume that goes on people's doors when they don't uh, remove their snow and ice, but do they do any other kind of like for a landlord situation, do they do any kind of communication with the landlord versus and the tenant? Todd, do you want to speak to that? <laughs> Fingers are flying. I'll just say the adjustments way overdue. Um, we're doing our best. We do notify one time, the first time after that, and it'll go mailed to the property owner the first time. And they have 24 hours after. It's very rare that we're there 24 hours after. It's repeat offenders. This is just a step that we're, city staff will not have to chase their tails around to, to try to notify them. They'll get notification the first time and that will be the hit, just like the weed notice or the mowing or anything else. They'll be following the same procedures that are in place with that. Mm -hmm. It's just getting up to speed with that. Thanks, Dan. Any other questions? Yes. I'll so, up. Um, I, I was wondering if, if we've changed the fee schedule to match up with, with the fee schedule that it was before. And now it looks like we're changing the fee schedule again to start using a cost per hour. But in, in um, the subsection of the snow ordinance, it's, 60 bucks per hour, not cost per hour. So do we need an amendment here to make this reflect that this should be cost per hour plus the fine? Or do we need to change the fee schedule for the fee schedule to read 60 bucks an hour plus the fine? So um, just to answer that, I'm gonna turn to Todd on this one. What I was understanding is this section that had the fee schedule, um, is this deleted and replaced with what's currently in it, or is it this section being deleted as a whole? Because I, I, I was under the same impression as um, Alder Person Zock, or Zop, sorry, that, um, that it would you'd be referencing the the fee schedule i think that's essentially how it wanted i think the the hang up here was this preceded the fee schedule change so we had nothing to go by with the the fee schedule change so then what i would recommend is that we make a we do amend this ordinance um to reference the fee schedule okay and staff can we can we can do that and work with. So um, the thought process would be um, moving to approve this ordinance with an amendment to reference the fee schedule. Okay. And uh, do we have a we have a motion to approve this right now? No. Not yet. Okay. Um, so I would make a motion to approve the um, updated fee schedule with a correction to um, delete the the fines and reference the fee schedule in place of the fines. Would that suffice? I, or do you need sp like specific sections? Okay. <laughs> that, sh that should suffice. The only condition being that you're approving this pending the fee schedule being approved too. True. Right. right. <laughs> but <laughs> I don't want to fix it twice. Yeah. <laughs> Tracy, did you understand that motion? Sure. <laughs> There a second. Alderperson Perkins. Thank you. Any comments or questions regarding the motion? Okay. Hearing, uh, or I'm sorry, go ahead and please call the roll. Fisher? Aye. Keel? Aye. Mark? Aye. Olson? Aye. Perkins? Aye. Wassell? Aye. Yuds? Aye. Zop? Aye. Anderson? Aye. Appenfeld? Aye. Matt? Aye. Burnett? Aye. Okay, then on the ordinance. He wasn't making the amendment. He was and the, the to include that on the ordinance. Okay, good. Are you good? 
All right. <laughs> <laughs> it's getting really late. Okay. Uh, moving on to resolutions. Resolution number 94-2023, a resolution authorizing city officials to opt out of PFAS settlement agreements. I'd entertain a motion to approve Alderperson Burnett with a second by uh, Alderperson Mark. Comments, questions regarding resolution? Explain it in two seconds. <laughs> yeah, um, basically, there are these class action lawsuits. You have to opt out. If you don't opt out, you stay in. Because the city doesn't have a detectable amount of PFAS, there is little to no benefit staying in these class actions because you're not going to get any money um, unless you do testing and then you get a few hundred bucks every year. So it's really not worth it because you're giving up any claims to 3M or DuPont or any companies that they acquire in the future. Questions? All right. Hearing none, please call the roll. Keel? Aye. Mark? Aye. Olson? Aye. Perkins? Aye. Wasal? Aye. Yates? Aye. Stop? Aye. Anderson? No. Er, yes. Sorry. Aye. Appenfelt? Aye. Burnett? Aye. Burnett? Aye. Fisher? Aye. All right. Moving on to resolution 95. Resolution number 95-2023, a resolution to approve the City of Beaver Dam 2024 fee schedule. I'd entertain a motion to approve. Alderperson Mark? Um, I'll entertain a motion to approve this um, fee schedule, which passed through the Administrative Committee. Is there a second? Alderperson's up. I'll second. Thank you. Comments or questions? There was one minor modification to this fee schedule. Um, the uh, It was a police... Um, I forget what it was for, I think copying CDs is $10. Um, it just was a mistype. So that, that will be corrected. All the persons that are, um, Yuds. Was the block party, uh, fee, uh, grant adjusted from $50? Uh, we, we discussed it at length <laughs> and it did not change. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Hearing none, please call the roll. Mark. Aye. Olson. Aye. Perkins. Aye. Wassell. Aye. Yuds. No. Sap. Aye. Anderson. No. Appenfeld. Aye. Burnett. Aye. Burnett. Aye. Fisher. Aye. Keel. Aye. Thank you. Resolution 96. Resolution number 96-2023. A resolution authorizing a disposal agreement for the 109 Ryan Cantafia's Way site demolition and abatement project. Thank you, Ms. Farron. Is there a motion to approve? Alderperson Burnett. That motion. Thank you. Second by Fisher. Do we need to? Yeah, there, one <laughs> clarification. So at the committee level, um, we have had some back and forth with the company. We've had some concerns with the agreement, so we're negotiating that. So the approval at the committee level was approving the agreement subject to um, review and authorization by legal counsel. Alderperson Wassell. So is the 147 or whatever that negotiated amounts going to be, is that uh, already part of the funds that are paying for this or is this additional funds to the city? So it's coming out of the ARPA dollars that we got from Dodge County. Yeah, so the, the price would remain the same. We just, there were some concerns about some of the terms in the actual contract. So that's what the okay. negotiations are. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, hearing none, please call the roll. Olson? Aye. Perkins? Aye. Wassell? Aye. Yads? Aye. Sap? Aye. Anderson? Aye. Eppenfeld? Aye. Burnett? Aye. Burnett? Aye. Fisher? Aye. Keel? Aye. Mark? Aye. Thank you. Moving on to resolution 97. Resolution number 97 2023, a resolution entering into an agency fund agreement for the Beaver Dam Pickleball Project and accept the Pickleball fundraising strategy. Thank you, Ms. Farron. I'd entertain a motion on Resolution 97. All the persons up. So we did amend this in committee as well. We removed the, 
was like a three part motion. We removed the part where um, we agreed to the, the naming strategy um, and we directed city staff to develop a naming strategy. And once that's developed, then we would um, entertain um, the approval of, of their naming strategy. So, okay. So um, the resolution is still coming forward. Resolution is still mm -hmm. coming forward as but not with the naming piece with yeah, absent naming. Okay. Yep. Is there a motion then? Alderperson Perkins. I make a motion. Thank you. Second. Second by Bonet. Comments, questions? Yes, Alderperson Sell. So do the uh, the 200000 that we've committed, does that go into the fund immediately once the fund's started? Uh, no, we're not. So this fund um, is, we're not sending our ARPA dollars to this fund. This fund is strictly set up for um, fundraising that this group, um, but we will maintain the the ARPA dollars and kind of an interest bearing account. And then when um, we're ready to move forward with the project, we'll, we'll disperse we'll because disperse we're actually doing the work. They'll, they'll actually write a grant or I shouldn't say they will, we will withdraw a grant from this fund that we oversee. Any other questions? Hearing none, please call the roll. Perkins? Aye. Wassell? Aye. Yads? Aye. Sapp? Aye. Anderson? No. Eppenfeld? Aye. Bonnet? Aye. Burnett? Aye. Fisher? Aye. Keel? Aye. Mark? Aye. Olson? No. Thank you. Moving on to resolution 98. Resolution number 98-2023, a resolution to enter a grant agreement and appropriate the grant award from Compere Financial to the Administrative Department. Thank you, Ms. Farron. I'd entertain a motion to approve resolution 98. Alderperson Wissel. So moved. Second. Alderperson Burnett. Second. Thank you. Comments, questions? Hearing none, please call the roll. Wissel. Aye. Yads. Aye. Sop? Aye. Anderson? Aye. Appenfeld? Aye. Burnett? Aye. Burnett? Aye. Fisher? Aye. Keel? Aye. Mark? Aye. Olson? Aye. Perkins? Aye. Thank you. Moving on to resolution 99. Resolution number 99-2023, a resolution accepting a proposal to provide employee health insurance coverage. Thank you, Ms. Farron. Is there uh, a motion? to approve Alderperson Burnett. I'll make that motion. Thank you. Second. Alderperson Mark, thank you. Comments, questions regarding Resolution 99. Alderperson Zop. I was just wondering if you could confirm if healthcare coverage is staying the same. I noticed that the plan from Dean was called high deductible plan. Um, I, I guess that was Interesting. I didn't think we were on a high deductible plan. We are on a high deductible plan. Okay. That's how we can have the HSA. Gotcha. So um, the federal government required a, an increase in the deductible to this year um, uh, to provide apples to apples. We had the deductible match um, the alternative um, plan that was the kind of the zero um, uh, increase, the security the committee, we discussed this at committee. Um, I think ultimately the committee was recommending moving forward with the resolution as is with the um, Dean Dean plan. Um, it did, instead of the, like I mentioned in the budget presentation, instead of it being a 6.8% uh, increase, the rate is a 4.8% increase um, to the city. So uh, instead of the $75,000 of savings, if you'll recall, originally it was a 10.9% increase what they had come at with us. And so we negotiated that down. And so uh, basically there's a there's $107,000 savings total from the 10.9 to the 4.8. So what was the savings because we weren't on a H, uh, high deductible plan before? So we've, we've, we've been on it. We we've been on a high deductible okay. plan. All right. Thank you. Yes, Alderperson Anderson. With the, uh, what do you say? We negotiated down to 4.8. Mm -hmm. Is that 
will city employees see their premiums increase 4.8 percent then yes yeah on their portion okay so on their portion they'll see they'll see an increase correct and then i also see the deductible went up are we supplying more into their hsa no so on top of the 4.8%, they are also going to incur an additional deductible amount. Well, mind you, the 4.8% is only on the, I forget which per, the percentage share, I think with the employee, the employee share mm -hmm. is how much percentage of the total premium. 13%. 13%. So mind you, it's not, it, percentages are... <laughs> Yes. Yep. Yeah. Yep. I get that. So what? A hundred and yep. um, a year. I, mean, I just figured it out for a family. Um, for someone today, and it was like eleven dollars a month increase for a family plan. Plus, then five hundred dollars in deductible for a single. I don't recall what it is for a family. Yeah. It was fifteen hundred and now it's seventeen fifty. So two hundred and fifty for the single and I think it's five hundred for the family. All right. Any other comments or questions? Yes, other persons ask. Was there discussion about offering or if we had the budget to provide an HSA contribution to the employees to help offset the increase in the deductible? No, we did not. We did not make a proposal for that. I think in talking with uh, the, um, uh, our broker, uh, comparatively, we're very competitive on the insurance, um, on our insurance rates as is. The increase in the deductible was primarily mandated by by the feds, um, and so um, we did not. We we took we basically applied the the one hundred seven thousand savings to to the budget. We did not um, budget or or make a uh, a request a new request to you all to apply some of that savings to uh, additional savings to be candid, I think the staff are going to be pleased with you selecting, sticking with the same provider, which could have, you know, you could have saved more money there too as well. So, and they probably would have been willing to pay <laughs> the 4% to stay with the same provider. I know other, not that I'm saying that we should have done that. Um, I think, I think staff will be pleased with the the decision to stick with Dean. Thank you. It is an extra cost of over $120,000 to the city to not take security. So, I mean, right. That is a we are benefit. Cost. Yeah. We are incurring extra costs because of that. Did you have something, Alderperson Perkins? I was going to make a comment that that's a pretty low percent in most, most of those cases right now, especially with all of our employees, it's usually 10% or more. So it's still pretty good. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, I think uh, health care is, yeah, it's very costly. Okay, yes, Alderperson Anderson. Yes, kind of go with that, but not really. But I guess in the budget I missed, what were we doing for the standard raises here for employees? What was negotiated uh, per contract is, is, I think, one and a half and one. Um, so there's a 1% lift mid-year. So total is going to be 2.5% increase, but um, the in budget impact is a 2% impact. That's for all employees or just the that's percentage? The, that's, what we, that's what we budgeted um, for all. Um, if you'll recall, the fire department had um, also negotiated in their last contract um, that should we make, should we uh, provide an additional increase that that would also apply to them? Um, but then the police <laughs> don't have that same. So it would have caused, I think, more harm than good um, to, to make a, 
make a, a different, uh, do a different scenario. All right. <clears throat> Anything else? Just one one comment mm -hmm. um, is that we we know inflation. Uh, we're we're going to need to be cognizant as I know contracts are going to be coming up uh, this next year. So I think the council is uh, very mindful, and I I appreciate your mindfulness of of staff. Okay. Hearing no other discussion, if you could call the roll, please, Ms. Farron. Yes. Aye. Stop. Aye. Anderson. Aye. Appenfelt. Aye. Burnett. Aye. Burnett. Aye. Fisher. Aye. Keel. Aye. Mark. Aye. Olson. Aye. Perkins. Aye. Wissell. Aye. All right. Very good. Moving on to 100. Resolution number 100-2023, a resolution granting a secondhand dealer license to James L. Mickelson doing business as Jim's Coins. Thank you. Um, I'd entertain a motion on resolution 100. Alderperson Burnett. I'll make that motion. There's second by. I'll second that. Thank you, Alderperson Wissell. Uh, comments, questions? Hearing none, please call the roll. Sop? Aye. Anderson? Aye. Appenfelt? Aye. Burnett? Aye. Burnett? Aye. Fisher? Aye. Keel? Aye. Mark? Aye. Olson? Aye. Perkins? Aye. Wassell? Aye. And Yuds? Aye. Thank you. And resolution 101. Resolution number 101-2023, a resolution granting cla a Class B, Class B license to DMN Hospitality, LLC, doing business as Comfort Inn and Suites. Thank you, Ms. Farron. I'd entertain a motion on 101. Alderperson Burnett. I'll make that motion. Thank you. Second by Mark. Uh, comments, questions? Alderperson Anderson. Just curious, did that property ever pay their backroom tax that was owed to the city? That property. I understand it's a previous owner, yeah. but I'm asking from that property. That, that owner that owned the building and was delinquent yes. did not. They did not. They did not. Okay. And the new owner is not taking any responsibility? The new owner does not have to, that does not follow them. Are we pursuing the previous owner? Because that was a substantial amount of money, was it not? Yeah, yeah. I don't, I don't know. There, We had a lot, a lot of conversations about that. There's really not strong law um behind that unfortunately um attorney shock went through that many many times um it was yeah it's frustrating there, there's not a strong way I, at that time anyway to collect the room tax yeah i mean you'd essentially have to sue them and at that point trying to collect you're spending more money collecting yep. i understand yeah. Yes, go ahead. In the future, can we make an ordinance or anything to have that apply to their property tax immediately when it becomes past due? Um, can we do a special assessment against them? So the room tax statute is pretty specific on your penalties and what you can do. Um, so, you know, one thing we could do is... Um, and I don't recall what the ordinance says right now on this, but typically like a, a liquor license ordinance could say like, we're not going to reissue or anything like that until all the taxes are paid. So that's, that's we already did yeah. that and yeah. they made an agreement to pay us back negotiated with someone, which is why we offered them a liquor license back. And then uh, we did not get the money back off of that. So if that's the only recourse, so let's. Mm -hmm. oh. I just know that I think there was some conversations about possibly implementing like a, like a hotel permit or license in order to have that kind of approve or deny every year. And I don't, I guess I don't know that conversation kind of, yeah. kind of led, but I do remember John Summers, I think, contacting either Larry or me, right? And inquiring about that at one point. So, yeah, I'll have to check with Larry on that one to see 
um, if anything came of that or, you know, we can discuss it in another meeting, get direction, I guess, on sure. some sort of license. It's a good question. All right. Any other questions, comments on that? All right. Hearing none, please call the roll. Anderson. Aye. Eppenfeld. Aye. Bonnet. Aye. Burnett. Aye. Fisher. Aye. Keel. Aye. Mark. Aye. Olson. Aye. Perkins. Aye. Wissell. Aye. Yads. Aye. Stop. Aye. Thank you. Uh, that does carry. And so I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. Alderperson Burnett. Make a motion to adjourn. <laughs> Thank you. Is there a second? Alderperson Anderson. Thank you. All those in favor of adjournment, please signify by saying aye. Thank you. Have a good night.